Okay. Weren't humans originally hunter-gatherers who killed and ate wild animals to survive? Isn't this what all people did until just a few thousand years ago? Um, that's what we have been commonly taught, and that's what a lot of people have taken for granted. But in fact, when you, one, look at um, human anatomy and physiology, it, it just doesn't uh, compute because what's crystal clear is that the more animal food humans eat, the sicker it makes us, the um, uh, shorter our lifespans. And um, it, it's very clear that our physiology is not designed to handle a lot of animal foods. I mean, right down to the fact that when we uh, eat nothing but animal food, we get constipated. I mean, that happens almost immediately. And um, it, it, it's clear that our bowels are, are, are not set up to handle a low fiber diet. And I think part of the problem with these theories that uh, developed is that they were developed by wealthy, uh, educated, predominantly male European anthropologists who assumed that the diet they were eating and that they were used to was the diet that human beings must have um, either evolved or uh, the human species developed uh, consuming. Um, I've often said that if early anthropologists had been physicians, they would have come to completely different conclusions because they would have understood that there's no way humans could have evolved on a meat-centered diet because it simply doesn't jive with our physiology. But it actually uh, goes beyond that because when you look at the metrics of it, meaning when you look at how much energy it takes to procure animal foods, it's very clear that humans simply aren't efficient enough hunters to have been able to procure enough animal food to live to eat a primarily uh, meat-based diet. Um, the fact is that hunting, even for the uh, um, uh, best by design carnivores in the world, lions, tigers, uh, pumas, you name it, is inherently inefficient. In the wild, these animals typically eat on the order of once every seven to 10 days uh, because it, they just don't make kills that often. But what makes such inefficiency practical for them is that they have very different digestive systems than we do. They have gigantic stomachs, and I mean gigantic stomachs, that allow them to eat literally 30% of their body weight at a single meal. So that means that once a lioness, say, who that weighs 300 pounds, makes a kill, she can literally eat 100 pounds of meat at a single meal. But if, let's say she kills uh, um, uh, a Cape buffalo that weighs 1,200 pounds, if she and her sisters are able to keep other animals from stealing what's left of the carcass, they can continue, so she consumes that 100 pounds of flesh, goes and lays under a tree for the next 24 hours to digest it, absorb all of those calories. Number one, she has a liver that can actually deal with such a massive influx of calories and not develop fatty liver disease because her physiology is designed for that. But once she's absorbed that meal, she can then go back to that carcass, and even though it's now putrid, rotting, laden with bacteria and uh, uh, maggots and, and all sorts of pathogens, because not only does she have uh, 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 intensely acidic stomach acid that will kill most of those pathogens, but she also has um, a uh, gastrointestinal immune system 
that is very adept at dealing with pathogenic uh, uh, organisms, she can continue to feed off that rotting carcass until it's completely gone. So she can continue to extract calories from that single kill that will allow her to recover all of the energy she wasted in that previous 10 days chasing things she didn't catch to, and uh, accumulate enough energy and calories to make up for what she wasted and still uh, have enough to repair her body, build up her body, support her pregnancy, and then last her until she and her sisters make another kill. Human beings cannot do that at all. Number one, as um, uh, plant eaters, we have stomachs that are designed for batch feeding. All carnivores can eat once every seven to 10 days and be fine. Herbivores are batch feeders. Because plant foods have so much uh, fiber in them, you have to eat a meal, process it, and then go back and eat another meal. And all plant eating species have to eat multiple meals every single day just to get enough calories to last them for a given day. And so they have much smaller stomachs that are designed for processing a batch of food and then go back and process another batch of food. So for a human being, if we expend two or 3,000 calories chasing some animal, let's say we're lucky enough to even kill and uh, catch and kill that animal. And that's a mighty big if because most uh, animals are able to outrun us, both by speed and by endurance. But we're just going to say, you got a given. Um, you're chasing something, this animal steps in a hole, breaks his leg, falls over, uh, people run up and they catch and they kill it. The fact is that at most we can extract maybe a thousand calories from that carcass before it becomes inedible to us. So we can't even really recover all of the energy we expended uh, trying to, to, to catch that animal. So we're already in a deficit, okay? So we're in a hole that we haven't dug ourselves out of. But it's even worse because the question is, what is the point of chasing large bodied animals? What are you getting from that? Well, you're getting a huge amount of animal tissue that is primarily protein and fat. Well, what does that do for us nutritionally? Nothing. Because our protein needs on a daily basis are very small. And our bodies cannot store protein. So that means all of the protein that we consume over and above daily needs has to be converted into carbohydrate or fat. Number one, that's energetically expensive. Number two, it requires a lot of water to do the processing, so it is dehydrating. And it means that wasting time chasing all of that protein, it actually got us further behind the eight ball because we got a bunch of material that we couldn't use, if I'm making sense. So it, it, it really is counterproductive to expend huge amounts of energy trying to obtain large amounts of protein because we can't use it. We can't store it. We can only use a small amount of protein and then the rest gets converted into carbohydrate. It makes much more sense to spend our time gathering carbohydrate that comes packaged with a modest amount of protein, which is really all we need on a daily basis. So I, I, I think those theories are just flat out wrong. Um, we, we weren't swift enough. We didn't have the kind of endurance. Um, we, uh, and when you look at um, the uh, uh, m amount of heat that would have been generated running around the savanna during the, the heat of the day, which is the only time we would, would have been able to hunt, we would have been much more likely to have a heat stroke than to catch an antelope. And a heat stroke on the savanna is a death sentence. Because number one, before you know it, 
you're going to be consumed by a hyena or, 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 or a lion. But that also brings up the fact, so what if these people were able to kill uh, a 300-pound antelope that they've chased, uh, let's say, five or six miles away from where their camp is? They can't carry that whole thing back to the camp. So again, the best that they can do, and, and you see this in modern Stone Age tribes, they have to butcher it on the spot and carry what they can carry back. So again, it's like leaving money on the table. Most of that carcass is left where it fell. So once again, energetically, they're behind the eight ball because they're in an energy deficit, they're in a nutrient deficit um, because they can't use all of that protein that they've just gotten. And so they're not getting ahead. Um, and, and it's really a massive waste of time. If it weren't for the nu nutrients and calories gathered by the women, these tribes would not survive. And so the idea that early humans were somehow uh, um, had the, the, the hunting prowess to be able to go out and consistently uh, acquire these huge amounts of, of, of protein just doesn't make sense. And even if they did, it wouldn't do them any good because they can't use it as protein. So there's no point in expending all that effort and energy on something you can't use. How does the bite force teeth and saliva differ in species that eat other animals versus those that eat plants? What does this say about what type of diet humans were designed for? Sure. Well, right off the bat, when you look at the saliva, the saliva of, of, of meat-eating species doesn't contain any digestive enzymes because clearly you can't liberate digestive enzymes in the mouth, which tasked with the job of chopping up and reducing uh, the, the body of an animal down to uh, chunks of meat that are, that, are, that are able to be swallowed. So that means that it's highly likely that in the process of biting, ripping, wrestling with this animal, you're going to injure yourself. Well, if you start releasing digestive <laughs> enzymes, in that situation, you're going to digest away your mouth, okay? Um, so there are no digestive enzymes in the saliva of carnivores. Herbivores, on the other hand, are uh, um, consuming plant starches, which have to be processed first by chewing, and the purpose of chewing is to mix them with the saliva, which contains starch digesting enzymes. So the actual process of digestion begins in the mouth as the animal is chewing the food. Now, even in the extreme herbivores like the ruminants, which have the multiple stomachs that eat a diet that's primarily cellulose, what they do is they come along and they actually just scoop up um, uh, grass and swallow it. They, they, they don't, initially, don't, they don't chew it. They swallow it. It goes into their first stomach, which actually contains this bacterial soup. And the reason they have the bacteria there is because bacteria release enzymes that will break down cellulose. And so they will stoop, scoop up a stomach full of grass, let it soak up those bacteria enzymes, then they bring it up and chew their cud. And the purpose of chewing the cud is to mix the grass with the bacterial enzymes. So again, the process of digestion begins as they're chewing. Then they swallow it, it goes into a separate stomach, and the process of digestion proceeds uh, apace. So um, carnivores and herbivores uh, handle their food very, very differently. And the herbivores do have enzymes in their saliva. The carnivores don't. How does the breast milk of humans compare to that of animals that eat other animals versus animals that eat plants? What does this say about what types of food humans were designed to eat. Sure. Well, <clears throat> the thing that people have to understand is that milk is not some magic elixir that 
just by virtue of being milk means that it's, uh, um, it's just good. Milks are designed by nature to be species specific. So for instance, if let's say you had a dog and your dog had puppies and your dog had puppies right at the same time your wife delivered your child and your wife brought the new baby home, the dog delivered puppies, but then the dog died. And let's say your wife said, you know what, honey, since I'm already breastfeeding our baby, I'm going to breastfeed these puppies. Those puppies would die. And the reason they would die is because there is not enough fat or protein in human milk to sustain the growth rate of those puppies. So in general, carnivore infants are born at a very immature stage of development. Their pregnancies are very short. Typically, they are 12 to 16 weeks. And that makes sense because clearly a pregnant uh, um, female carnivore can't have this huge belly and be out there chasing other animals, wrestling with them, and trying to kill them because she'd end up killing herself and, and her, her, uh, her babies that she was carrying. So they have short pregnancies, deliver these very immature uh, 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 infants that essentially complete their development outside the womb. But as a result, carnivore milks are very high in fat, very high in protein. Why are they so high in protein? Because proteins are building blocks. Uh, uh, proteins, protein is not used for energy. Protein is used to make tissue. And you only need a lot of protein if you're rapidly building tissue. So again, carnivore milks have much more protein in general than uh, the milk from uh, plant-eating species because carnivore infants are growing at a much more accelerated uh, pace than, than uh, 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 herbivore uh, or plant-eating uh, uh, species. Um, they also have a lot more fat, and again, it's because these babies need a lot more energy because they are growing a lot faster. Um, and uh, and it, it turns out that not only do they have a lot more protein, but that when you look at the, the composition of those proteins, they're very different from species to species because the amino acid composition of the proteins determine how growth stimulatory they are. And so the proteins that are found in carnivore milks are very pro-stimulatory. Uh, they stimulate growth very aggressively. And that's as it should be because anybody who's seen baby kittens or baby or puppies that have just been born, they, 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 they're almost barely formed. Uh, their, their eyes are closed. They can't regulate their body temperature. Um, they are, they're like little, they almost look like uh, um, miscarried fetuses because they're, they're so, so immature and they have to have a lot of energy, protein, and so forth to, to help them to grow. Now you contrast that again with the herbivores and, and the, the two that, that I want to focus on are cows and humans. What's interesting about cow and human milk is that in terms of the total amount of solids, it's essentially the same. In terms of the amount of fat that's in cow's milk versus human milk, it's actually uh, 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 the same. But what's different is cow's milk has one and a half times as much protein as human milk, but human milk has almost one and a half times as much uh, sugar as, cow, as cow's milk. So why those differences? Well, number one, even though from a percentage standpoint, the amount of fat in cow's milk versus human milk is the same, it's completely different fat. Uh, when you look at cow's milk, whole cow's milk, it is uh, thick, creamy, opaque, white. When you look at uh, human breast milk, it is thin and translucent. 
And that's because the fat that's in human breast milk is unsaturated fat. The fat that's in cow's milk is highly saturated, which is why you can churn it and, and get butter or take it and make ice cream. You can't do that with human milk. Um, and as I said, there's a lot more protein in the cow's milk because a baby calf is growing at a much faster rate than a baby human. Um, a, a baby calf basically will go, from, if it was allowed to live its natural lifespan, from birth to adult weight in like two to three years. That's a phenomenal growth rate because you're talking about going, on, going from roughly 65 to 70 pounds to 1,000 pounds in three years. And so the proteins that are in uh, cow's milk, casein, uh, BSA, bovine serum, albumin, and so forth are very growth stimulatory proteins. Um, and they're designed to make that baby calf grow. Um, and they do the same thing to humans when we feed the uh, cow's milk to human kids, but that is not good for us in the long run because studies have shown that human children who are brought up on cow's milk have a much higher risk and rate of breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease, uh, high blood pressure, and stroke as they move through their lives. So it, this, 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 this pro-stimulatory growth effect these protein, cow proteins have on human physiology ultimately create disease in the long run. But what's even worse is, as I said, even though a human infant is, what, eight pounds at birth versus 65, a 65 pound calf, still the human uh, breast milk has uh, about one and a half times as much sugar. Why is that? It's because proportionately, the human infant's brain is so much larger than the cow's brain. And the brain prefers to use only sugar for its metabolism. So when people raise their babies on cow's milk, they're actually starving that baby's brain because it's not getting enough sugar for the amount of energy that it needs. Is it true that calcium is found in all green leafy plant foods? Absolutely. And, uh, you, uh, the, 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 the silliest, most ridiculous uh, uh, belief that you find in Western countries is the idea that somehow you can only get calcium from, uh, from, from, from milk or from cow's milk in particular. Actually, when you look at nature, nature does not build adult skeletons with calcium. When you look at the period of time that infant mammals nurse, they're very short periods. Most of the calcium that goes into the skeleton of any mammal comes from the food they eat, not from their mother's milk. And um, the, if you were to take a six-foot man, take all of the muscle, organs, skin off his skeleton and just weigh his skeleton, the bones alone would weigh about 25 pounds. And it takes that man 18 to 20 years to actually grow that skeleton. Now, you take a bull moose, and you've seen the rack of antlers on a bull moose. That bull moose grows those antlers in a three-month period. They're made out of solid bone. And when they're fully formed, they weigh 80 to 85 pounds. And it does it eating nothing but green plants. There is plenty of calcium in green plants. It is, in, in fact, it is the, one of the worst ways to try and get calcium for skeletal growth is for milk. That is not the way nature does it. It's not the way we should do it. Why is cow's milk high in calcium if cows don't drink milk? Where do cows get their calcium from? from the grass the cow is eating. What are the health benefits of having a lot of fiber in our diet? What's the best source of fiber and what's the worst source of fiber? Sure. The benefits of having a high fiber diet are really too numerous to list in, in one place. I mean, we can talk about some of them, but they are just uh, um, a myriad. And we can't even list them all because we don't know them all. Um, but 
uh, one thing we know, for instance, is that the, when you e habitually eat a high fiber diet, you select for a bacterial population in your colon that becomes very good at breaking down that fiber into these bioactive compounds called short chain fatty acids. And there are uh, uh, three principal short chain fatty acids. The first is a four carbon short chain fatty acid called butyrate. Butyrate is critically important because the cells that make up the lining of the colon actually prefer to use butyrate as their energy source. They don't like extracting energy from the bloodstream. They prefer to get it from the lumen of the colon, uh, from the breakdown product of, of, of fiber fermentation. But what that means is that if you don't have enough fiber in your diet, then you don't have enough butyrate, and as a result, the cells in the colon become weakened, they don't maintain their tight junctions, and literally, you start to get leakage of uh, the contents of the colon down between the uh, colonic cells into the bloodstream, and that is leaky gut syndrome, and that leads to inflammation, can exacerbate or even uh, um, uh, engender autoimmune problems, uh, and a host of other pro-inflammatory uh, diseases and, and issues. The uh, next short-chain uh, fatty acid is a three-carbon short-chain fatty acid called propionate. Propionate is an incredible compound because propionate does some amazing things that we actually use medicines for. So propionate inhibits an enzyme called HMA-CoA reductase. Now, that sounds very bizarre and weird to most people, but it should be an enzyme everybody knows because the most um, lucrative drug uh, category ever created by humans are statins, the uh, drugs designed to bring down cholesterol and help lower the risk for heart disease. Statin drugs, the target enzyme for statin drugs is HMA-CoA reductase. Well, if you're eating a high-fiber diet, you will actually create in your colon a compound that will inhibit that enzyme better than a drug can without the side effects. But it doesn't just stop there. Propionate also stops the liver from uh, manufacturing glucose, which is the same way the diabetic medicine metformin or glucophage works. So here again, by eating a high-fiber diet, you will create compounds in your colon that will do for you what medications uh, do without the side effects. And there's even some evidence that the propionate can also help decrease uh, uh, triglyceride levels, which we use drugs like Lopid and, uh, and uh, other medications for. And then the uh, third short-chain fatty acid is a two-carbon uh, short-chain fatty acid called acetate, which our muscle cells can use instead of glucose, which means that our stores of glucose will therefore last longer, which means that we don't get hungry as often, which means we don't eat as much, and helps us maintain a healthier body weight. So, um, that, though, and those are just some of the ways that fiber helps. Um, we also know that there are compounds in fiber like lignans and other compounds which are acted on by um, the bacteria in the microbiome to make them potent anti-cancer compounds. Um, and they get absorbed and actually help turn on genes that suppress cancer, turn off genes that will promote cancer. Um, and the, the point is that when people tend to think of fiber, they tend to think of bran cereal or uh, something like Metamucil. Fiber uh, really is all of the undigestible or unabsorbable parts of plants that we eat. So there's water-soluble fiber as well as water-insoluble fibers, and it takes all of those various kinds of fiber to give you the best overall fermentation products in the colon. Um, and that can only come from eating whole plants. You can't get it from artificial products. Um, you have to eat the whole plant. And the greater the variety you eat, 
the better uh, um, uh, the, the fermentation process is in the colon, and the healthier your colon is, and the healthier you'll be. Where do the largest, strongest animals on this planet get their protein from? Is it <laughs> true that they're all vegans or herbivores? Th well, th there's, there's absolutely no question that the largest, strongest terrestrial animals on the planet are all strict herbivores. And that is not only true now, but it's always been true. Because when you look at the biggest, strongest dinosaurs, they were the plant eaters. And there was no T-Rex on the planet that would attack a full-grown uh, uh, sauropod. Because those dinosaurs were so huge and so strong, they would have easily killed uh, a T-Rex or, or uh, uh, any of the other smaller carnivorous type dinosaurs. It's just like even today, no lion, no tiger will attack a full-grown, healthy elephant because they will easily kill them. And so the biggest, strongest land animals are now and always have been strict plant eaters. Um, and where do they get their protein? From plants, because only plants make protein. All protein that is found in animal tissues is recycled plant protein. We've been told we need animal products to be healthy. Is this true? Is this true for certain blood types? Um, oh, that makes me want to go find a padded room so I can scream and throw things. Um, no. Number one, there is nothing in animal tissue um, that we need or that we can't find in a healthier form in plant foods. Um, now, there, are, there is a specific nutrient, namely vit um, vitamin B12, that when you look at the usual things Westerners eat, is more commonly found in animal foods, but that's because those animals either ingested uh, bacteria directly or ingested bacterial products. But all B12 is made by bacteria, and the reason that we don't find B12 in plant-based diets in modern Western countries is because we've eliminated the natural sources of B12. Again, all B12 is made by bacteria, but we've sterilized our water, we grow our plants on B12 deficient soils, then we wash them like crazy, and so we've eliminated those natural sources of the bacteria that make the B12, and that's why it's more difficult to get B12 from our environment or just from the plants. But the easy solution to that is simply to take a supplement. So the, the difficulty with B12 on a plant-based diet in Western countries is an artifact of the way we live. It has nothing to do with the deficiency of the diet, per se. Uh, but there is nothing in uh, uh, animal tissue that we need that can't be found uh, in in, in uh, plants uh, or a plant-based diet, and in fact, uh, these nutrients are actually um, uh, in much uh, healthier uh, um, and better form coming from plants. And there are scores of nutrients that you find in plants and uh, plant foods that you cannot find in animal foods, and that has to do with all sorts of antioxidants, all sorts of phytochemicals, um, and the various kinds of fiber. None of that is to be found in animal tissue. You mentioned that all protein is made by plants. Is it true that no animal is able to take nitrogen out of the air and incorporate it into an amino acid, and that only plants can do that, so any protein you get from an animal source is secondhand plant protein? That's absolutely true, and, and, and that is the key. That um, what makes protein protein is the presence of the element nitrogen. And nitrogen, um, when air is like over 90% nitrogen, but the nitrogen that's in the air is in the form of uh, nitrogen molecules that are triple bonded to each other, very uh, inert and active molecule, and only plants uh, working together with bacteria have the enzymes necessary to break apart those nitrogen molecules, and then change them chemically so that they can be incorporated 
into the amino acids that make up the proteins uh, that first become plant tissues, and then when the animals eat them, they become animal tissue. So only plants can make protein, and that's why any protein found in an animal is recycled plant protein. What's the relationship between meat consumption and Alzheimer's? Um, the studies show that those countries that eat the most meat have the highest risk and highest rates of Alzheimer's disease. And um, Dr. Popper actually is doing a brilliant lecture uh, um, for this uh, uh, event where she is even presenting data that show that is showing that that as countries adopt a more Western lifestyle, you can directly correlate their uh, uh, increase in eating meat and dairy and other animal foods with an increase in Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. So there is a direct correlation. How does the digestive tract differ in species that eat other animals versus those that eat plants? What does this say about the type of diet humans were designed for? Sure. So uh, meat actually, animal tissue actually, is very quickly and easily digested. Um, and you know this because you know that if you leave a piece of meat on the counter, it starts to rot. It starts to break down on its own. Because if, it, if, it, if you don't have uh, um, a blood system to deliver oxygen to it, if you don't have an immune system to kill off the bacteria, the cells start to disintegrate. So animals that eat animal tissue and that are designed to eat animal tissue actually have very simple and very short digestive tracts. They have very short uh, small intestines. Their small intestine is usually only about three to four times their body length and they have a very short, straight, uh, 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 large intestine because their large intestine is really designed just to uh, store leftover uh, remnants of a meal for a very short time and then it, get it out of the body before it starts to putrefy. Because unlike plant foods, there's no fiber in uh, animal tissue. Therefore, once they've extracted all of the nutrients from it, what's left over can only putrefy. It can't, they can't extract any additional energy or nutrients from that material. So they just need to get it out of their body before it starts to poison them. Plant uh, eating animals, on the other hand, because of the presence of the fiber, number one, it takes a much longer digestive tract to be able to extract those nutrients because of that fiber. But then, because the fiber itself uh, can be broken down, as I said before, into these energy uh, containing compounds, um, short chain fatty acids, and it can be turned into vitamins and so forth, they have these really large, long colons so that they can give the bacteria time to actually work on the fiber, break it down, turn it into these bioactive compounds that really help uh, improve their health and physiology. And so, in general, you see that the plant-eating animals have much longer small intestine, much bigger, longer uh, pouched large intestine. And that's exactly what you find in human beings. How does human anatomy compare with those animals that are designed to eat other animals, like a lion, versus those that are designed to eat plants, like an elephant? Um, actually, interestingly, um, the human uh, digestive tract is very similar to that of an elephant. Elephants. Again, simple stomach, long small intestine, capacious, long, large intestine. Um, we have a jaw structure that is designed for processing plant foods. So we have flat nodular uh, molars. Uh, we have uh, um, a jaw joint that's above the plane of our cheek teeth like other plant eaters, whereas lions, um, like a typical carnivore, have jaws that are built like shears um, where they have blade-like uh, molars that slide past their lower molars in a vertical fashion, which allows them to slice uh, meat off bones. They have long, dagger-like um, uh, canines, short peg-like incisors that really are used for scraping uh, flesh off bones. And 
uh, and they can develop these really huge uh, bite forces uh, in their jaw so that they can crack and break bones apart that they can then swallow and digest and that's where they get their calcium from from the bones of the animals that they eat. Tell us more about how Dean Ornish showed increased telomerase activity after only three months on a plant-based diet. Why does telomere activity matter? What telomerase is, uh, for the listeners that don't know, telomerase is an enzyme uh, that will lengthen these bits of DNA at the end of chromosomes called telomeres. The reason telomeres are so important is because the longer the telomeres are in your cells, the longer the cells will live. And the longer the cells live, the longer you live. Also, the longer the telomeres are, the more res disease resistant the organism is. So the whole idea is, I mean, theoretically, if we could come up with a way to increase our telomeres indefinitely, we would live forever. But every time a cell divides, the telomere gets a little shorter and a little shorter. Now, the telomerase counteracts that to some extent, depending on how active it is, by lengthening those telomeres. But eventually, the telomeres get to a point where once they are short enough, the cell will die. And once most of the telomeres in your body are short enough, you die. So the whole idea is that we want increased telomerase activity because that keeps our telomeres as long as uh, we, we can keep them, which means that we will be the most disease resistant and we will live the longest that we can. And what was important in the study you mentioned was that Dr. Ornish showed that after as little as 13 weeks on a, a, a vegan plant-based diet, they got increased activity of that telomerase lengthening uh, or of that telomere lengthening enzyme telomerase by up to over 80 percent and that's phenomenal. Do you agree with Dr. Michael Greger that experts estimate 80 percent of major disease and premature death in this country could be prevented by making major changes in our diet and lifestyle? Oh that's absolutely true and and that's the great tragedy that most of the disease and premature death that we see and that we have all personally, personally experienced in our family and uh, with friends and acquaintances that we know could have been prevented if these people had lived and, and eaten differently. Why are people willing to let doctors crack open their chests, strip veins from their legs, carve out pieces of their internal organs, shoot them with radiation and fill them with toxic chemicals all in an effort to get their health back? That's a very good question, and I, and I uh, tragically, I, I don't have a good answer for it. I mean, I think part of it is that, is ignorance, is that many people don't know that there is an alternative and that there's a better way. Most people think this is just what happens as you age. As you age, you get sick, you start to fall apart, and if you're lucky, you uh, have your heart attack, you go to the hospital, and then the doctor does all these things to try to reroute the plumbing around your heart to buy you a few more years. But the fact is that none of that has to happen if people would change the way they eat and live. So wouldn't it be much better for people to do the simple thing and eat the plant-based foods they were meant to eat in the first place? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I frequently... Um, uh, tell the story of uh, the Syrian captain in the Bible, his name was Naaman. And um, this happened during the time of the prophet Elisha. Uh, Naaman was a captain in the Syrian army and he developed leprosy, which back in biblical times, leprosy was a death sentence. But not only was it a death sentence, because it was so contagious and such a horrible disfiguring disease, when someone developed leprosy, they had to leave regular society and go to a leper colony, which was just these horrible places with these miserable, disfigured people set apart from normal society where you basically just existed until you finally died of the disease. And so when Naaman realized he had leprosy, he was devastated and horrified, and, but he had as one of his servants, a uh, Hebrew girl, who said to him, she said, 
um, my master, she said, there's a prophet in Israel who, if you went to see him, I'm sure he'd be able to cure you of your leprosy. And Naaman was overjoyed to hear that news. He gathered up this whole huge retinue of camels with costly garments and gold and gifts and presents and took this journey into Israel to where Elijah was living and uh, sent the servant to call the prophet out and she went in and she explained why they were there and um, Elisha said go tell your master go down to the River Jordan bathe in the River Jordan seven times and it'll be cured and when she went out to tell Naaman what Elisha had said and Naaman was furious he was like I came all this way brought all this stuff and this man won't even come out of this hut and speak to me it's like we've got much better rivers in Jordan than this little muddy stream called the Jordan. And he was just about to leave in a huff. And his servant said to him, she said, my master, if he had asked you to perform some great feat, wouldn't you have been happy to do it? She said, why not just do the simple thing he asked you and see if you get your healing? And Naaman thought about it. And he relented. He went down to the Jordan. He bathed in seven times. And when he came up the seventh time, his leprosy was gone. And I love that story because just like you said, we are willing to take these toxic chemotherapy drugs. We're willing to let people cut open our bodies, remove parts of our organs, reroute the plumbing to our heart. We're willing to do all these great things to try to get our health back once it's gone when really all we have to do is do the simple thing of eating a plant-based diet to avoid all of those problems to begin with. Did ancient humans have the correct eyesight and night vision to chase, capture, and kill animals on a regular basis in order to survive? Anybody that stubbed their toe on a coffee table trying to go to the bathroom at night knows that that's not true. <laughs> we can't see at night. and. Um, Carnivores, their vision is actually optimized for, for uh, night vision. They actually see up to six times better than we do in the dark. They have kind of these permanent inbuilt night vision goggles. And that's why if you shine a flashlight in a dog or cat's eyes, it reflects out at you because they literally have a mirror at the back of their retina that amplifies low light levels so that they can see well in the dark. And that's because they're hunting in the dark because their prey animals are sleeping, makes them easier to catch. No, we were safely hunkered down uh, uh, away from anything. We weren't out trying to hunt anything. What can we eat and do to lower our risk of cancer? I, that's a critically important question. And, and, and the re one of the reasons is that because as a physician, one of the things that I often hear cancer patients being told, and, uh, and it's just it almost makes me apoplectic, is their doctor will tell them, I don't care what you eat as long as you eat. I just want you to eat whatever. And that is some of the worst advice you could possibly give a cancer patient. And the reason is that studies have shown that when people convert to a plant-based diet, even post-diagnosis, they live longer, they're likelihood of a cure is greater and even if they don't get cured their time of disease-free uh, survival is increased but beyond that there are countless stories of people who've been diagnosed with cancer who then went became vegan and strictly plant-based who actually went on to cure their cancers with their diet and you know some people may find that incredulous, but actually there are very good reasons for that. And it has to do with what is it that drives cancer. So one of the ways I, I try to help people conceptualize this is I, I show people a picture of a, of a cow, of an elephant and a rhino, and I ask, what's the natural diet for these animals? And they say plants, of course. I'm like, okay. What's the only time in those animals' lives that they eat animal protein? A lot of people say never. And I say, ah, think about it. 
when do they eat animal protein? And after they think about it a bit, they say, oh, when they're nursing, when they're babies. I'm like, that's exactly right. And for plant-eating animals, animal protein is a growth signal. It turns on growth genes. It stimulates the liver to release a hormone called insulin-like growth factor that tells cells to grow. Well, if you're an adult and you're signaling your cells to grow, they can't grow. But what they can do is start to form tumors. And a lot of those tumors will be benign, but some of them are going to be cancerous. And this is why people have lipomas and moles and, and cysts and all of these things is because they're eating this animal protein and, uh, and or uh, dairy products which are filled with growth stimulants that are turning on growth genes that shouldn't be on. And in an adult, those growth genes are, in essence, oncogenes or cancer-causing genes. And so if someone is diagnosed with cancer, the worst possible thing that they could do is to continue eating animal protein because they're continuing to feed that cancer. It's like if your house catches on fire and you call the fire department and they're in the front pouring water on the fire and you're in the back throwing kerosene on it. It's you, you, you're, you're going to eventually die if you don't change your diet. You've got to stop doing the things that are driving the cancer. And, that, and those things are the animal protein, the hormone-laden dairy products, um, the diets that are low in fiber because low-fiber diets create inflammation, which studies also show drives cancer. That pro-inflammatory environment in the body drives the cancer cells and makes, it, makes them more likely to grow. And, and then the other thing is it's important to switch to a plant-based diet because the plant-based diet will turn off those cancer uh, genes and turn on tumor suppressor genes. And then there are compounds that are in the plant foods themselves, like cruciferous vegetables, that actually are toxic to cancer cells. There are compounds in citrus fruits, lemons, uh, uh, garlic, onions, that actually kill cancer cells. And uh, studies have shown that blood from uh, um, uh, vegans is uh, seven to 12 times more toxic to cancer cells than people who eat meat. So it's, a, it's this two-phase process. You need to turn off the things that are driving the cancer, but start eating the foods that will suppress and kill the cancer cells, and those are the plant foods. How does the frequency of eating and the amount eaten at a meal differ in species that eat other animals versus those that eat plants? What does this say about what type of diet humans were designed for? Sure. Well, um, meat eaters are intermittent feeders. Uh, again, hunting is inherently inefficient, and they typically in the wild will make a kill once every seven to ten days. So they, uh, they eat today and they may not eat again for a week or more. Um, and, and that, parenthetically, is one of the reasons why pet animals are so prone to getting fat because we feed them every day. They wouldn't be eating like this if they were living in the wild. And so they just start accumulating all this fat. Again, the herbivores, it's totally different. The herbivores eat multiple times every day uh, because they are batch feeders. They'll eat a meal, takes you know, several hours to process that meal, then they go back and eat another meal. And so they have to eat at least two to three times every single day just to get enough calories to last that day. Uh, and that's because their stomachs are much smaller because they're designed to process a batch of food as opposed to these giant stomachs that the carnivores have that allow them to eat enough calories to last them, you know, a week or two. How does eating plant foods turn off cancer-causing genes and turn on protective genes and then pass these effects onto your children and grandchildren? That's uh, through the process of what's called epigenetics. We know that, that plant foods uh, modify the what are called histone proteins that wrap the DNA uh, and protect the DNA in our chromosomes. And so when you eat a diet that's high in plant foods, you, uh, 
um, you get what are called these uh, acetyl and methyl groups that are attached to these histone proteins, and that then makes it more likely that the cancer-causing genes are turned off and the, the tumor suppressor genes are turned on. So it's really important to understand that the food that we eat literally interacts with, talks to, and programs our DNA. But what's uh, really amazing about that is that we know that those effects can be passed down through three and maybe as many as four generations in humans. It's been documented that what are called epigenetic effects have been shown to be transferred from parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents down to their offspring. So it's critically important how we eat because that's going to affect our uh, progeny. Do you feel weak and tired if you eat a 100% whole food plant-based diet? <laughs> you know, um, professional athletes are, are switching to plant-based diets because they're finding that, uh, you know, contrary to feeling weak and tired, um, they are stronger, more robust, um, they have greater energy, greater stamina, and they recover from uh, exercise and competition much quicker and more efficiently. Uh, that's what the film Game Changers is all about, and that's what it, it shows. And what's interesting is um, I had the um, uh, pleasure of meeting um, Tennessee, ex-Tennessee Titan Derek uh, uh, Morgan and his wife Charity, um, and who uh, were a instrumental in getting as many as 15 of Derek's teammates to become vegan. And what was so profound about that was that uh, Derek started changing to a plant-based diet uh, in his 30s because he wanted to extend his career. And he found that by becoming, uh, as he became more and more plant-based, his performance improved and his uh, recovery time decreased to the point that he decided to become completely vegan. And then uh, his wife, who was a chef, um, she decided for health reasons to uh, follow suit. And then she started preparing all of his meals. When his teammates saw how well he was performing on the field, they said, hey man, can she, can, uh, she provide food for, for us? And, and the upshot of that is that the Titans hadn't been in the playoffs for, I don't know, I can't, I, I can't remember exactly how many years, but we know that this year they made it to the AFC title game, and that, that may have been the first time in the franchise history, and they did it by going vegan. And um, there are a number of NBA players who have become vegan, again, because of the performance enhanced, enhancing uh, abilities of a plant-based diet. Uh, uh, Novak Djokovic, is very vocal about his uh, uh, being vegan and how it's helped him perform uh, and remain in top uh, uh, peak condition uh, and, and remain a top competitor in the tennis world. And I always tell people, look at Western civilization. We didn't hitch our wagons and stage coaches and plows to lion, tigers, and bears. We hitched them to horses and oxen and steers because only they had the strength, energy, and stamina to do the work that needed to get done. How is diet connected to depression? What foods create more of it and which prevent against it? Sure. Um, the, there is now abundant research that shows that plant-based diets decrease uh, the risk and prevalence of depression, anxiety, and other mood and behavior disorders. And a part of this is uh, mediated through the fact that the gut talks directly to the brain, that uh, part of what the microbiome does is it manufactures neurotransmitters, which then travel directly to the brain and influence brain chemistry. But even more importantly, we now know that when there isn't enough fiber in the diet, that the toxins that get uh, released from the colon can actually travel through the bloodstream and damage the brain and actually change neural architecture such that it inhibits the action of uh, the cells that actually make myelin 
uh, in, in the uh, central nervous system so that your brain just doesn't work as well or as efficiently. So um, what you eat um, uh, in terms of fiber has a direct impact on how uh, well your brain is working and uh, on decreasing the toxin load that could be affecting how your brain is working. How are human bodies built to make them ideal for foraging for plants? Um, that's because we are the most efficient walkers uh, on the planet. Uh, foraging for plant foods is um, an activity that requires covering a lot of ground at a low energy cost, and that means walking. Well, humans are the most efficient um, uh, walkers of any animal. Um, when we walk, we expend a lot, a sig significantly lower amount of energy than would be predicted for an animal our size, and that has to do with the way our bodies are built and the fact that because of our upright stance, every time we take a step, our center of mass actually falls outside of our body so that part of the work of moving us forward is done not by muscle activity but by gravity. And we really just throw our legs out to keep ourselves from falling and we vault over that leg and we keep doing that. So we're actually falling forward but that's also why any interruption in that finely tuned process makes us look so goofy and we almost fall on our face because it's a finely tuned ballet that has to be done in a precise fashion. Can you sum up everything we've talked about here today in 15 seconds? <laughs> Gosh. We are absolutely designed to be uh, plant eaters um, and we are healthiest. Uh, we live the longest, um, and we are happiest when we are plant-based. And um, we need to get back to our true uh, diet, and that's a plant-based diet. Be better for us, better for the world, and certainly better for the other animals we share this planet with. What's the one thing I need to do today? Eat a high-fiber plant-based diet that is comprised of a variety of foods and colors. It's pretty to look at and it'll be beautiful inside your body. What was it about the Real Truth About Health conference that made you want to come here and speak? The fact that the range of speakers was so complete, the list of topics was so thorough, and that it was free to the public. I, I, that, actually, that's the thing that just stunned me, that you, that the organizers of this event provided such an incredibly high quality conference with essentially almost all of the major speakers in the plant-based health movement to the public for free. I, I, it is just, just phenomenal. Um, as I told the, 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 the audience at the beginning of my talk, if people were going to have to pay for the lineup that um, uh, they assembled here, this would be a $10,000 conference, easily. For people that want to learn more about your work, where should they go? Um, they can go to my website. It is drmiltonmillsplantbasednation.com. Again, Dr. Milton Mills, plantbasednation.com, uh, and there are links there to my videos and things that I've written, um, and they can find a lot of my videos on YouTube, uh, and keep your eyes open for a book that I'm working on. Is if I can ever find enough time away from work where I can focus on writing, I'll get it done.